Hello, my good friends from Israel. I'm Ricardo Kern and I'm here to present to you a little bit of few information and important information about a soft tissue management case that I'm going to present to you guys. And this case is going to be like a teaser uh, for the information that we very soon is going to present to you in Tel Aviv in a two-day soft tissue management course. The case that I'm going to present you now is going to bring already some very precious information, very important information that you already can take and start to apply in your everyday job, in your office. But of course, this case represents a little bit of what we're going to discuss with more time during the course. So you can have not just something that you can take available now, you're going to have like a sample, what came next, what you're going to do on the course, and I'm really going to invite you to enjoy us very soon in Tel Aviv for this course, okay? Uh, so let's go straight away uh, to discuss what is important now to really, really make valuable the time that you are spending now watching me present and to sharing this case. Uh, this is a very nice case. Uh, actually, when you start to treat this patient, I received this patient referred by a prosthodontist in Brazil. I live in Brazil. And to prepare this patient uh, for aesthetic rehabilitation. As you know, part of our job is not just really, really to create a healthy tissues around implants and around teeth. Also, part of soft tissue management is completely prepare some case for the aesthetic rehabilitation because nowadays you know how hard it is to really really take uh, some clinical case to the highest level without any management on the pink line on the pink contour on the gingival frame around your veneers around your crowns around your implants uh, in some case, the key point is not just about the restorative part. Some key points or some clinical cases, you're going to have the best of it if you can manage and, and change uh, the aesthetic proportion that the pink frame or the gingival frame can give it to you. And this is a good example. This case was sent to me to prepare for the restorative part. This, this patient is going to receive new crowns and some veneers, okay? And I need to change the soft tissue level in many different places here as you're seeing that. If you're going to discuss a little bit about uh, what uh, need to be made in this course, uh, first, first thing, uh, in my opinion, this is a clinical case that should be prepared a little longer about the orthodontic treatment how the position uh, of these crowns could be a little bit improved by the orthodontic treatment. But at this point, the patient was done with the orthodontic treatment. So what was left for me was really, really prepare the case uh, in the soft tissue level. So let's take a look now, starting by the central incisors. Uh, this crown here, these central incisors, the proportion and between width and length and the gingival contour is very good. The gingival level is very close to the upper lip. This patient really, when this patient is mild, the upper lip goes a little bit uh, higher than that. But the, the, this central incisor is one of the reference what is very good position in, in, in this uh, mouth. And uh, the new veneer for this patient is going just to change maybe a little bit the incisal edge position. Based on these central incisors, we're going to really, really change the opposite central incisors. Basically, uh, changing the gingival contour in here, doing a crown lengthening in this area. Okay. Now the two lateral incisors. As you see here, the zenith position of both lateral incisors represent a recession position. I cannot do a new crown or new veneer in these uh, two lateral incisors based on what I have now. So one of the lateral incisors, that is this one, this is, this is a crown over implant. I have a old implant here, external connection, and I have a different in the gingival level position. 
So part of the treatment is going to corner advance this gingival margin. And if you can see here, the color of the gingiva is not good. It's a little bit of gray gingiva area. I'm going to do a connective tissue graft and we're going to change also the color of this gingiva based on the thickness uh, augmentation. Also during the treatment, you're going to develop a little bit a better position vertically speaking about this papilla and also the volume, the buccal volume of this papilla here. As you see from here to the opposite side, there is a difference in the volume. So my connective tissue graft is going to modify all those aspects in the gingival margin, okay? Uh, in, in the other uh, lateral incisor, actually it's not a lateral incisor, was a canine that was orthodontically brought to this place. And uh, talking about the orthodontic movement, uh, for me it would be better if this uh, canine really, really have a better position, not with the long axis in this way. It would be way better for me to have already the long axis fix it straight away in the center and also a little bit of uh, orthodontic extrusion. Uh, bringing the cervical margin together. That would make my life way better, uh, talking about the way we really, really uh, going to, to, to do a, another connective tissue graft in this case, to do a root covering, to change the cervical margin, more or less emulated what's supposed to be the perfect lateral incisor thing frame, okay? What else are you going to do? Basic on the, the zenith distribution, both sides, you're going to see that the zenith in this canine here is different from the zenith in the another canine. So we're going to do a crown lengthening in the opposed canine position. And from this position, a little bit of crown lengthening in the premolar, maybe a little bit in the last molar, but I don't think we're going to change that. And in the opposite side also, just a small crown lengthening. If I can completely change this pink contour position, I'm going to prepare this case for the restorative work to have the best chance to offer aesthetic result for this patient. So let's go there. This is basically what we discuss, small modification on the incisor edge position that is going to be made in the sequence and then the, th the pink frame. It's amazing how, uh, how can I say, the diagnostics of this patient, uh, the digital planning of this patient, help me to give the best surgically speaking. Uh, when a patient is going to receive surgery and restorative work, usually the surgery is, is done before the restorative work and I'm going to build up the gingival position to offer for the patient uh, the best proportion between width and length. But when I do the surgery, the restorative different or the new incisal edge position is not there yet. But the digital planning gives me this future view for me. Why am I talking about that? Because a small modification, oh, let me just return this here to the other example, one, one second. Uh, okay, this small position here of the lateral incisor that is going to be the future incisor position or, may, or even this position here of the central incisor, eh, we try to work with the perfect proportion of width and length that is close to 80 percent it means that based on this new incisor edge position or the future incisor edge position that i really really build up my case or the treatment for the surgery to bring the cervical margin exactly for this position so this position here is not randomly made or just let do the surgery and see what the restorative work 
we really can do for the patient later. The idea is to build up the surgery extremely connected for the uh, future treatment plan for this patient or the restorative uh, treatment, okay? So we started to work uh, in the full watch and the, the, the surgery, but I'm going to approach with you guys step by step, okay? So this canine here, as you have been seeing, or this lateral incisor now, uh, is going to need to have the cervical margin being brought in coronal direction. One very nice uh, movement or flap design that you're going to discuss from A to Z in the course, it's a way to coronal advance the center of the flap but what is the problem? The problem here that is these central incisors I'm doing crown lengthening. This premolar I do in crown lengthening. So I'm going to remove gingiva in one side. I'm going to re remove gingiva in, in the distal side. But in the center I want to move the gingiva in the opposite direction. The way we design the flap as you are seeing here bringing the incisions, design the collar, but now there is a small detail. When I bring this incision to the side of the tooth that I'm going to root cover or cover and advance the flap, actually what I'm doing is design a surgical papilla that is here. The surgical papilla is going to advance at the end of the surgery to this position. This movement that I bring sideways the flap and also with a small current vent advance, uh, advance give me two things. First, when I move sideways the flap, the central part of the flap really, really moves a lot in that direction. The center of the canine or the center cervical margin of the canine is going to stretch this contour, stretching and moving that in coronal direction. While the opposite movement is going to happen on the central incisors, when I bring the surgical papilla closer to the central incisor, I still maintain the cervical margin pretty high in the position that I have designed the color incision. It means that I can advance the flap in the center, but in the same time I'm keeping the interproximal area in the apical position that I have done the incision. So design and understand how to design surgical papillas to do this kind of movement. Not just going to help you guys in this small detail of the treatment plan. When we treat multiple recessions with different level of recession, different size, different height of recession, Knowing how to design surgical papillas and advance the flap in a different ways help you to advance this different recession exactly according to the want or the amounts that you want to advance. Finish the surgery with the cervical margin completely in an even way. Distribute exactly as you want. Okay, that is one of the key points that you're going to work during the course. Okay. So after that, the interproximal area here, as is a root covering process, I'm going to do a small partial splitting area on the interproximal side because I want to have a little bit of the periosteum on the ground to help me to nourish my connective tissue graft, to help me to have this small periosteum to give some sutures to make the anchorage in the establishment position of my connective tissue graft, okay? That is one of the, the points to have some uh, partial splitting on the interproximal site. Of course, the gingiva here need to be removed. I want to do crown lengthening in this area. And I'm going to also 
make a depthalization area on the papillas. Why is that? Because as you know, this part of the flap is going to be brought laterally over this interposimal papilla. So if the flap from here is going to end up over the papilla, I need to remove the epithelium of this area in order to this area to be a nourishment island. Okay? If I maintain here the epithelium, if I maintain the keratinization, this movement is not going to work. And one advice that I'm going to give you guys, don't really, really be pity about removing the epithelium on the papilla. Be aggressive there. Because a lot of people that I see, one of the mistakes is really not remove well the epithelium on the etiposmal sites. So when we advance the flap over this area, maintain part of the epithelium on the ground is going to avoid that you merge flap and recipient side. It's going to delay that. And is key point is way important that the flap is stay in the interprosmal site merging to the ground. This establishment help you to give mechanical stability to the flap position. And mechanical stability for the flap position means that the recession on the position of the flap on the recession in the center of the canine is going to also be maintained. Not to remove well the epithelium here means that the flap is going to be brought and after just a few days when the suture starts to lose the grip, the flap opens, the papilla does not merge, you have a small aesthetic problem, the papilla formation, but with this relapse of the papilla, what happened also, the center of the flap or in the recession that you want to treat, you're going to see that the recession appear again, okay? And the easiest way, the clean way for me to do the job is using a 12 blade. I have done that with high speed burns. I have done that with micro scissors that we spend 700 euros in one very nice scissors. But to be honest, the easiest way to do and the fastest way is to get a simple 50 cents 12 blade and engage exactly under the epithelial layer that you can identify if you pay attention here exactly where the epithelium is start and where the connective tissue start engaging under and sliding that taking the epithelium in a single movement now I have a good recipient site for the flap to lay down okay it's amazing how much small information we can take from a single clinical case like this one so I'm going to treat the recession on this canine to change this canine to a lateral incisus. But I'm going to change the premolar area to do crown lengthening. As we remove a little bit of uh, gingiva, I'm going to relocate the, the bone crest position in order to maintain the biological width uh, for this area. Otherwise, you know what happened the gingiva grows back very fast, okay? So we're going to realign the bone position. And just one detail here. Everybody adopt a steady position for the crown lengthening. Everybody adopt like three millimeters distance from the cervical margin to the bone crest. Just to bring a small detail that we're going to discuss very deeply on the course. Biological width is a measuring between samples, between people. When I'm going to check for the main reference here that we use in the literature, the Gagiolo work as uh, an example published by Gagiolo, the average of his sample was at 2.85 distance between the bone crest to the cervical margin to have connective tissue attachment, long junctional epithelium, in a space for the sucos. So that sample was taken, taking different measures. And if you're going to see in the same work, they have biological width distance that was larger than four millimeters. 
in the same sample they have biological width of distance that was less than two millimeters. That is exactly what happened with my patients, with your patients. The patients are different. If you adopt the same distance for everybody, do you know what can happen? If you get a super thick phenotype patient with the gingiva that is very thick, the bone is thick, and you adopt just three millimeters of biological width distance, sometimes on the post-op of this patient, the gingiva crows over the position on the immediate post-op. In the same time, if you adopt 3 mm for a very thin phenotype patient, very thin gingiva, and you adopt 3 mm, do you know what happened on the post-op? The gingiva relapsed. You have a small recession position. And we need to understand how to identify, how to read the phenotype of the patient to adapt some of the information or some of the decision measurements for this patient. Usually thick phenotype patient, I need to extend a little more this distance. While thin phenotype patient, I need to diminish a little bit this distance to customize the surgery for this patient. If I customize the surgery, I try to focus better my result exactly for that patient. I'm going to control the gingival level position during the healing and not the opposite where the healing sometimes changing the position of the bone level, the soft tissue level, okay? Uh, so crown lengthening here, we're going to uh, move now. I'm going to reduce the bone. I'm going to bevel the bone. One thing that you're going to work from A to Z is really crown lengthening during the course. That is a nice part. We start on the course talking about crown lengthening, okay? Center inside is the same thing. I have one level that I need to reduce. You see the difference between before and after. So I have some millimeters more the cervical margin exactly with the biological width for this patient from the new gingival margin, right? And one thing here that is super nice for us to discuss. In the recent years, we understand that the emergence profile of the implant or the crown that you try to change the gingival level completely influence the position of the flap or after the healing. If you want to extend similar concept, you can look for the information of BOPT preparation or BOPT concept, Biological Reentry Parental Therapy. Basically, uh, this work uh, developed by Loy was how much the emergence profile influenced the thickness, the phenotype, and the gingival position. If we understand this concept, we can start to use this concept for prosthetic management. We can start to use this concept not just for prosthetic management, but together with my soft tissue management, my soft tissue surgery for crown lengthening to root covering for conditioning over implants. Changing the emergence profile influences a lot the position, and that is another key point that you're going to use. If I'm going to see this very long canine that completely the crown and the enamel is distally placed, I have a small buccal projection. You see the zenithy completely outside the position, that I want to have, if I want at the end of the treatment, has like a lateral incisor, this whole emergence profile here is going to push the gingiva back, okay? I cannot change that. So in this treatment, in agreement of with or together with the patient, we completely redesigned the emergence profile of the enamel. Already preparing this case for the new veneer to really, really change that as a lateral incisors. So we reduce the enamel, we change the emergence profile. This is base or similar like a, a BOPT preparation. From this on, I still need to prepare and to release the flap. So my incision get under the flap to release in this flap. And there is a place 
that really, really, I need to be precise about this treatment that this incision here cannot be made under the flap in any position or in a randomly position. I cannot place this incision between muscles. That is going to bring many problems uh, on the performance of the surgery. Why is that? If I randomly just cut muscles, the releasing that I can get, it's okay. It's okay, it's not good. It's okay, it's not excellent. I want to have a releasing that really, really is going to move as much as possible the flap. It still maintains some muscles on the flap. I have another problem. Muscles bring mechanical instability on the flap position during the healing. And you know that movement or mechanical instability on the flap position during the healing also can affect the performance of the surgery. So this incision here is not randomly placed. This incision needs to be placed over the muscular surface. It means that this incision must to be precisely placed just below the mucosa surface over the muscle surface. This way, when I coronal advance the flap, no muscles is going to be inside the flap. I'm going to have more advanced, more mechanical stability. And I, there is a very nice thing that I need to discuss deep with you is the biology healing behind excluding the muscles on the flap advance that completely influence the way the connective tissue is going to interact with the flap is going to promote attachment is going to promote keratinization unfortunately do not have all those time to discuss that okay so flap is prepared here uh, flap is released everything is fine and then we get to the palatal side of our patients to remove a free gingival graft or a graft that is going to receive the deepitalization outside the mouth in order to work with the most rich layer of connective tissue available on the palate of the patient. Rich, talking about collagen fibers concentration, okay? So I'm going to remove this connective tissue. This is my donor site. You see how we harvesting, really, really respecting the patient. This patient here is going to be able to have a very good post-op. This technique has a small step-by-step -step for us to really, really do a harvesting without uh, no extra damage in the donor site. The patient is going to have a very good healing if we respect and we really, really we harvest this way. So outside the mouth, what I need to do with this uh, graft, I'm going to need to remove the epithelium and just to work with the connective tissue, really. I'm going to use one piece of this connective tissue from one lateral incisor, and you know that in the other side on the implant, I'm going to need to use another connective tissue graft. Sutures, and then I'm going to corner advance this flap, and one side of the treatment is done, I still need to do the opposite side. You see here, after removing the crown over implant, how is the deficient site? I have loss of volume, I have recession, I have difference in the color, and my connective tissue, if you've done that in the right way, that can help you to treat all those deficiencies. What I'm going to do on the premolars here is do, once again, crown lengthening, we're not going to lose much time talking about crown lengthening. We're going to focus a little more in other important sites. So crown lengthening done from premolars. Now is the time for me to do the connective tissue graft around this uh, implant. Uh, there is many questions that people ask me about. Ricardo, when do full thickness, when do partial thickness, when to decide case to case? And I'm going to tell you that the decision process is really very simple. When I know a little bit more deeper the anatomy and the physiology of the periodontal tissue or the perimplant tissue, it's going to be very easy for me to design surgery to surgery where to place full thickness and partial thickness, when to detach with a tunneling instrument, when you start to work with a microblade like this one. 
And if I can really, really decide in a simple way, you're going to see how it is to plan the surgery for different patients. Uh, soft tissue surgery, there is a particular thing uh, about it because it's very difficult for me to replicate the same technique patient to patient because uh, the patients, they are completely different talking about the defect that you are imagine, managing. One patient with the same recession classification can be treated with a different surgery because the classification, Miller II classification for a recession, for example, are going to need to pick up one technique in one patient, but if the other patient has a freno, probably I cannot use the same technique anymore. And so the idea to know better the anatomy, the physiology, and the reasoning process, how to treat the flap, is going to make me free to adapt patient from patient how I can manage the specific technique that we already know or the technique that maybe in the future you're going to understand or going to learn. Uh, because you know what needs to be made with the, the tissue. And that is another key point during the course, is how to understand, how to read the defect, how to read the patient, to customize the surgeries that I need to do for the patient, okay? Of course, we're going to talk about techniques. We need to take some techniques home, but we need, and I want you guys to need, how to really, really apply this technique for different patients or different deficient sites. Otherwise, you're going to always be stuck on the deficient or decision process. And I know even if you are already experienced in soft tissue surgery, you know how difficult sometimes it is for us to try to see one case to another case, what I need to do here, what I need to do there. And understanding what I'm going to bring on the course is going to make you free on this process and make this process much more easier, okay? In this case, I'm doing partial preparation over the implant uh, for a very simple reason. This is a sternal connection, and this sternal connection on the buccal side, the implant design have some threads exposed. It's very regular. And if I have some threads, or if I have a regular neck, uh, one implant, I have some fibers going in and out these small depressions contour caused by the threads exposition. If you have once in life tried to detach the tissue full thickness around the implant, you know how hard it is to detach the tissue between the threads. Uh, so it's more conservative sometimes to use a blade to do this process. But there is one detail. If the tissue is not so thick in this attached area, on the keratinous eye area, one thing that I need to be concerned is doing the preparation of the flap, not to make this flap even thinner. If you have a thin phenotype patient and you make this flap even thinner, you compromise the blood flow of the flap and the chance for you to have a necrosis during the healing augment a lot. So this partial preparation, when I do in a thin phenotype patient, I need to bring this partial preparation really, really close to the ground, close to the bone, close to the implant or the thread position in order to keep the thickness of the flap constant, not diminish that. Okay, otherwise I increase the risk of necrosis. So this way, with a partial splitting close to the ground, I'm not going to promote a lot of ruptures of fibers as a full thickness detachment with a plenum instrument could promote. And I still maintain the thickness of the flap. Okay, I know that sometimes we are bringing fast information but uh, yeah, I have just a few time to discuss this case with you. Blade goes inside the tissue, and now the blade, instead of going down, the blade moves sideways, and then returns sideways once more. Why is that? 
because if you go deeper here, work a lot in the distal margin, can remove, then you go medially, go deeper. Sometimes you do not prepare the tunneling area of the recipient side in an even way. I need to prepare that in the same plane, in the same position. So go with the blade one, two millimeters deeper, then you move sideways to the medial margin. And when you move sideways, always the cutting edge of the blade that is moving to the medial margin need to face to the ground for you not to have the risk to perforate this flap. Small and precise information to help you to manage case like this one. Okay. Once again, when I move up, I'm going to arrive to the mucogingival line. If you remember what I was talking about to you on the canine recession, I need to have a small corner advancement of this flap. So the position of the blade now once again needs to be turned to the surface of the muscles or under the layer of the mucosa very precisely. And I'm going to show you guys uh, on the course how to do that very precisely. In the center of the canine, in the center of the central incisors, is full or partial splitting, Ricardo? That's a good question. This usually is full preparation. Why is that? Because if I'm going to make a small analysis of the thickness available on the periodontal structure in the full mouth of our patient, the area that the periodontal tissue is thinner is exactly in the center or in the buccal surface of the crowns. On the interproximal side, the thickness is better. On the palatal side, the thickness is better. And one general rule, never make a tissue that is thinner even more thinner. Otherwise, you compromise the blood flow and your chance to have a necrosis increase a lot. So what I'm going to do in the center, full thickness detachment, okay? We are using a small curette to help me to raise the tissue on the papilla's shoulder because my graft is going to lay down under this structure. And you, you, nowadays you have a specific tunneling instruments to do this job. It's amazing. This is a case that already has some years. Full thickness detachment in the center of the central incisor is the same thing. And I'm going to do full thickness detachment until the mucogingival line level. From this point, I'm going to need to release the tissue. So the same thing that I was or oh, I did in the center of the implant, I'm going to do now in the apical margin of the canine and the apical margin of the central incisors, cutting, undermining the periosteum, and from that position going to the surface of the mucosa. And as is a tunneling, I'm going to need to do that with a micro instrument, a micro blade, as the one we are using here from MGK instrument. So that is the position going to the surface. Now I can have a freedom of coronal movement of my flap. That is my connective tissue graft, and I'm going to need to give, uh, how can I say, uh, during the suturing process, I need to give more stability for my connective tissue graft. One of the basic rules of the suture is not just to bring the connective tissue in place, is to do that and do that in the best possible way to increase the mechanical stability of everything, okay? I'm going to bring on small details, very important. What am I, what I'm using the, uh, the probe here? Ah, Ricardo, you use the probe maybe to open the space for the needle to bite in the tissue and get to the sulcus. Well, that is easy to understand, but also I'm, I'm using the probe here for a very specific reason. I have tunneling the tissue sideways, right? Uh, and when I, I did that, I detached this flap from the ground. As I detached this flap from the ground, the flap can move. Okay, okay that is logical. But one thing, if I bite my suture in a flap that moves, my question, using this anchorage point that moves, 
is going to increase the stability of my connective tissue graft? Absolutely no. But if I bite more medially and more distally to the tunneling site and get my needle on the place that the tissue is attached to the ground, and from that anchorage point to the connective tissue graft, can I improve the stability? Yes, for sure. So what my uh, probe is doing here? The probe is going sideways and the probe is going to get exactly the border of the tunneling space because immediately to that the probe cannot move more, cannot advance to that. Agreed? If cannot advance to that, it means that exactly in this millimeter here, the periosteum is still attached to the ground. It's exactly in this millimeter that I'm going to bite my needle. Why is that? Because the tissue is attached to the ground and that tissue is exactly on the border of the space that I need to run the needle inside. If I bite here, the tissue moves. You do not increase the mechanical stability. If I bite over there, you're going to bite and you're not going to find the tunneling space. The needle is going to go in the tissue and out the tissue and you have not room to get to the sucrose. Simple, but it's very effective. Details. High performance on the soft tissue surgery, I cover off small details like this one I brought to you, okay? So let's move now from this space here to the other space. I'm going to move the suture again. Of course, I'm going to move with the non-cutting part of the suture in front because I just want to move the suture material until I get to the sulcus to bring my connective tissue to the tunneling area. And I do not want to engage anything on the way. So that's why we move the needle with the non-cutting part in front. I'm going to engage my connective tissue graft, make my way back once again with the non-cutting part in front and moving to the anchorage point. So now I can tunnel my connective tissue graft to the original place. Nice. Both sides are going to do exactly the same. So I'm going to stretch the connective tissue graft. And one thing, once again, taking care of the emergence profile. Uh, it's like, a, this is BOPT, no, this is not BOPT, but mechanically speaking, it's the same thing. I need to take care how much pressure I'm putting with the crown, with the implant, with the abutment on the tissue surrounds. And I need to control where the pressure must be stayed and where I need to give space for the connective tissue. So we reduce a lot of the abutment and also the temporary design in order for this connective tissue to stay in the right place and of course to have a space for coronal advance the whole uh, set of flap and connective tissue graft. Lateral sutures and courage position the connective tissue align horizontally uh, to the cervical margin. But this lateral suture does not corner advance anything. I'm going to need a specific suture to do this job. I have many different options to do. I think in every different occasion, one of the options perform better. And in this kind of situation, that is a multiple tunneling, that I have one, two, three crowns that I receive a connective tissue around this area. In multiple tuning, tunneling uh, sites that I have in this case, three crowns, one sutures that perform very well is the double cross sutures described by Otto Zur some years ago. And if you're going to look for the original paper publication, you're never going to understand the design, not never. I looked at that first time and go, my God, how to do this suture? Because you have all the sutures design, it's very di uh, difficult for me to check that step by step. And you make this easier. Uh, basically, this suture is start on the buccal side, giving a bite on the flap and in the connective tissue graft and emerge in the palatal side. One small tip that I'm going to give you. When you give this bite, it's better for the connective tissue to stay really, really high or coronally in the flap space, okay? Otherwise, if you bite the graft already with some millimeters 
8 equal to the margin, you're never going to have the connective tissue in the right position. How to bring the connective tissue uh, to the cervical margin? In, with a very simple movement, we use the tomb and we squeeze the, the flap in the apical margin. In squeezing the flap, of course, the connective tissue going higher until the level that you intend to have it. With the connective tissue higher, when I bite the needle through the flap, I'm going to get exactly the connective tissue in the proper place. Now that I bite through the needle, the flap and the graft is going to stay with the relationship I wanted. They are dating now exactly in the position I wanted, okay? So we're going to bite and emerge on the palatal side. I bite. And after biting the tissue, I'm going to get the needle and I'm going to give a completely turn over or around the contact points here that I create. I bonded the contact points between my uh, crown and the teeth. Okay. And this contact point is going to be used as the anchorage to brought this tissue in a corner direction. Stop here now look at the drawing you see that we have one bite into the tissue and then one completely turn over the contact points if you give this completely turn on the contact point once again the needle or the suture is going to stay on the palatal side now ricard what is the next step if you understand this that you give a bite and a turn what came next is very easy for us to understand. What I'm going to do is exactly the same thing, but now from palatal to lingual. What is the exact same thing? One bite, one turn. Okay? So from buccal to palatal is one bite, one turn. Then from palatal to buccal is one bite, one turn. Okay? Let's see how is that. So I'm going to get my suture, and now I'm biting from palatal to buccal. That is the needle. What I need to do now? One turn. One turn means I'm going to give a completely uh, round uh, movement around the contact point. So, wow, when I see the design now, it's, wow, to understand the whole picture is difficult, but to understanding the step by step is very easy. One bite, one turn, then one bite, one turn back to the buckle site. Okay? The easiest way to understand is something like that. But I have many, many examples for you to left the course, understanding exactly which suture to use for different approaches and how to perform the suture. Nice. And this is on the protection of the donor site. What we are using nowadays is a very simple uh, procedure that gives me mechanical stability for the wound. As better the mechanical stability for the wound, better the post-op. Uh, comfort for the patient and what we are using we are using flowable composite to hold inside the wound area a collagen fleece so the collagen fleece or the collagen membrane or even I can use here PRF membrane is going to protect the donor site and the simple thing that I'm going to use is to use flowable composite to hold this membrane in place. If the flowable composite can stay there for seven days, 10 days, two weeks, the connective tissue is going to be protected during the healing with the patient has the comfort to bite, to eat something without that distress the donor site. Far away from anything else we have been trying, this is the simple way to do the job and not just that, the feedback from the patient about donor site had improved a lot. 10 days of pause up, and this is the beginning. This is the immediate result. You already have a completely change, change valve contour. This is 10 days pause up. You're seeing that everything healing very well, and uh, the outcome. Oh, my goal is talking about what I want to offer for this patient or prepare this patient for the future is very good, okay? Nice. What I need to do, wait for the dentist that saw, send the case for me to finish the job and send me the final pictures. And it took me two years 
to receive this picture back. So this is the final result of the patient with the final restorative work. A nice work done by Albano Luis Bueno with the new veneers aesthetic treatment. And sometimes we need to wait for the referral to, to send this case for us. Guys, I know that is just one case, but I'm going to tell you something more. If I had more time, I could even discuss one more hour the same case with you, going even deeper on the details. That is just a sample, a teasing, what we can really, really do with more time. And if you want to enjoy us in Tel Aviv, very soon the dates are here. Uh, we're going to have this time available. Okay, shalom, uh, welcome everybody. I hope to have the chance to see you face to face, to know you, and of course, when we have a time together on the course, one of the things that dentists really, really gave me is the opportunity to know different people from different places, and, and some of these people I take as a friend, uh, and my friends from dentistry is a privilege that I have, and really, really, I'm going to have more time to share with you good dentistry. Also, that is the reason, okay? See you soon, and I hope to meet you in Tel Aviv, okay? Bye-bye.